So with that, I want to get to our keynotes. I'm sure you're all waiting for uh, this. So our first keynote speaker is uh, John Donovan uh, from AT&T. And I thought the simplest introduction that I can make about John is he's the person who is transforming AT&T uh, in terms of how AT&T builds its infrastructure, how it does business. And in the process of doing that, he's also transforming the whole service provider industry. And I'm really delighted to have John uh, be the keynote speaker this morning. I suppose some of you want to know more in terms of John's introduction. So maybe let me say a little bit more. Uh, he has... Uh, uh, been a leader, leadership position at AT&T, where I sign in code. Uh, and then at AT&T, he's responsible for a big chunk of AT&T, uh, all the way from network infrastructure, vision, strategy, implementation, operation. And the big program, Domain 2.0, uh, obviously is under his leadership as well. So with that, I would like to welcome John uh, to come and share his thoughts with us. Good morning. Thanks, Guru. Um, good morning, everyone. It's hard to believe it's been more than a year since we were together here. And I laid out for you AT&T's plans to transform our network through a software-centric approach. The term audacious was how one blogger described it. And we certainly appreciated that. To be honest, there was great energy in this room last year, and I was thrilled by your response both in the room and afterward. But a lot has changed since then, as we've put our plan into action. And a big part of that plan is not just our use of open source software, but also our contributions back to the open source community. So I'm going to share with you today some of those open source interactions helping to software accelerate AT&T's network. But before I dive in, I also want to mention that the Q&A session here last year was really enjoyable and memorable for me, so I'll feel like I missed the mark if my points today don't generate some great questions or even some challenges from you at the end of my scripted remarks. I'm ready and hope you are too, and that's what makes this conference so much fun. So AT&T is becoming a fundamentally different company. Anyone reading our headlines knows that we expect to look very different by the end of this year. What I'm going to elaborate on today is the radical transformation that's well underway in our network, and most important, what that means to you. I provided you a high-level outline last year and noted some of the successes along the way at Mobile World Congress just a couple of months ago. Unlike any of our competitors, we've put very aggressive milestones out there, and what we promised is that we would keep you posted on our exact progress against those targets. But today I want to dig a little deeper and talk more specifically about how AT&T is becoming a software company, one that's built largely around open source software. So let me offer some context. When I started with AT&T, it was 2008, we were a very different company. Back then, development cycle times were measured literally in years, not in the months or even weeks like they are today. Today, we're approaching innovation more like a company you'd find just up the 101. That's part design. It's also partly need. And I have to admit, it's part serendipitous. We had to approach innovation like this to handle the significant challenge that we're facing. The fact is, our business has been dramatically changing. As this chart illustrates, it was in 2010 when mobile data traffic passed the mobile voice traffic on our wireless network. And with mobile data traffic alone, 
I'm talking one of the most radical demand curves that business has ever seen if you extend the time frame back to 2007. And this is a large scale network. This is 100,000% wireless network growth between 2007 and 2014. A lot of this is due to the popularity of smartphones, but the real inflection to the curve has been the onset of mobile video. Video now makes up the majority of traffic on our network. And in 2014 alone, let me repeat that, in 2014 alone, the total video traffic on our wireless network doubled in just that one year. That's, just not, that's not just an issue in the mobile arena, but that also translates for AT&T in the wireline side of the business. And our business is further changing as we're seeing the same type of dramatic change as Ethernet growth takes off and we migrate away from TDM. So from a technology perspective, we're changing. But when you're talking about entire business models from entertainment to education to business also being turned upside down, Throwing more equipment at the network part of the problem isn't the answer. You can't scale that quickly and cost effectively. It's simply not sustainable. At AT&T, we knew we had to think differently. We needed to approach the problem with a different point of view. And to do so, we had to create a new ecosystem that thought similarly. Before, our industry was built around the specify, standardize, implement approach. That's too slow and cumbersome. While standards are still important, particularly in regulated use cases like aviation or power, for example, but we need a more agile approach, something more suited for a software-centric world. So we're looking for a better balance between traditional standards processes and agile software-driven open ecosystems. It's a fundamental component of our solution. And that's why I'm standing here in front of you today. So the vision, ultimately our vision is based on two key concepts. The first is software-defined networking the second is network function virtualization. Instead of relying on specialized hardware for network functions, these concepts transfer the heavy lift to software. Last year, I painted a picture of our foray into SDN, and, I'm, and today, I'm pleased to say that we're well on our way. We plan to virtualize and control more than 75% of our network using cloud infrastructure and a software-defined architecture. I noted last month in a blog that the first 5%, and in fact the most important 5% to establish a critical foundation will be complete by the end of this year. And we're going to do it relying a great deal on open software. In fact, we've already introduced products based on software-defined network concepts that are providing real and tangible benefits to our end customers. If you take Network On Demand, which is a product we have, it was an early stage idea this time last year. We took it from idea to trials in just six months. Network on demand essentially allows our customers to increase or decrease network bandwidth as needed in real time. This means that they can use just what they need when they need it. In just a couple of short months, we introduced it into the market. We, we trialed it in Austin, and then we added another half dozen markets late last year, and today it's available in more than 100 markets and it's getting rave reviews. Here's a quick look at what it can do. Let's roll the video.
Network On Demand is a new service that we're creating in AT&T, giving the customer the flexibility to change services on demand. Customers today are reacting to an environment that's constantly changing, and they need their network to keep up with them. Today, if you look at what we basically put on the customer prem, you've got multiple devices, right? Starting from the router that goes on the customer premise. If customer wants a firewall, that's another hardware device. If they want an application acceleration, that's another device. So it could have four or five or even more different devices. In today's environment, the customer has to phone in changes, and those changes often take weeks, if not longer, to implement. With Network On Demand, we're giving the customer the actual interface into the network to make those changes in real time. We've started with software-defined networking, which is the ability to really program the network. We want to go away from a static model of offering enterprise services. Using the new software capabilities available, we want to give the customer access to a portal or through an API where they can dynamically make changes to existing services or add new services. With Network On Demand, it takes weeks and months down to close to real time in order to provision networks. The next thing is network function virtualization, which is our ability to abstract the software from the hardware. And once we do that, we can spin that up in any location in the network. We virtualize all the network functions. So in one physical box, we can run multiple virtual functions. And we can use OpenFlow to service chain the traffic from one virtual function to another virtual functions. We're actually having virtual instances of the software on one platform. Instead of a customer actually buying multiple hardware devices and multiple software devices, it's one device that we can spin up these virtual services on demand. So as opposed to putting hardware for every network functions on the prem, we can run each network function as software on that prem and allow the customer to customize that to their needs. What we want to do is change the customer experience. Where today we have a static environment in place that gets configured, with Network On Demand, we're really putting the keys back in the customer's hands. As you can see in that video, we're pretty excited about this. So where do we go from here? Now, while some competitors are still figuring out their SDN strategy, I want to talk about the next two phases of our SDN deployment. Phase one is virtualizing our existing network functions. I don't want to oversimplify it, but we're essentially taking a network appliance and converting the things it can do into a single software program. You then run the software on a cheaper, less specialized box. And a great example of this is the work that we're doing in our mobile packet core. For our voice over IP networks, we're virtualizing key components such as session border controllers, load balancers, routers, firewalls. And you know, some might in this room might call this the low-hanging fruit, but I call it moving quickly and proving out our concepts. I also call it proof that our vision and path is the right one. Now, secondly, the, the phase two is what we're calling disaggregation, and this is really a, a challenging part of what we're doing. With this approach, we disentangle all of the various subsystems in each function, and we essentially strip them down to their core components. We then rethink how they're constructed. We separate them and we re-architect them in a way that makes sense for the particular strengths and the attributes of the cloud. Think of it as approaching a complex puzzle that's made up of smaller puzzles that were put together for their own different purposes. So we're essentially stripping it all down and rebuilding it in a more efficient way, and we're questioning how it's constructed at each step of the way. Our initial target for this disaggregation process is our gigabit passive optical network open line terminals. There's the telecom buzzwords for you. We call them GPON OLTs, complex stuff. These are the devices that we install in central offices to enable internet access to our residential and our business customers. It's a core aspect of our U-verse with gigapower strategy. It's our one gigabit per second super high-speed broadband deployment that we've launched in multiple markets across the country, including nearby here in Cupertino. The customer response to this service has been amazing. They can't get enough of it. But the equipment we initially intended to use can be complex and expensive, which puts constraints on how quickly we can proceed with these deployments. 
It's close to the customer and it needs to be flexible. It also needs to be reliable and efficient. So this is exactly the area where SDN concepts can really shine. We're virtualizing the physical equipment using less expensive hardware. And not only are we able to create a more flexible system, but we're also finding that we're reducing power consumption in the process. We're able to scale faster by putting more connections onto a single box. And we're seeing so much promise that we're creating an open specification for these devices so that any ODM can build them for us. It's not necessarily a new concept. We're taking some aspects from web companies, to be honest with you. And what's different is that this is the first time a telco has done this. And it's a new and original implementation for this type of equipment. We expect prototypes shortly with trials and deployment next year in 2016. One of the tenets of our open source community is that you don't just take code, you contribute it as well. A lot of the software to enable this virtualization of our open line terminals came out of our AT&T Foundry Innovation Centers, including the one in Palo Alto and AT&T Labs. Those engineers are now working with the open source experts at ON Lab, and the result is an open source system to support broadband access just like Gigapower, and it's called CORD. CORD is short for the central office re-architected as a data center. We think that the system will not only benefit AT&T, but other carriers and MSOs alike. It definitely accelerates the overall innovation ecosystem, and that's good news for everybody. We've even developed a software tool to configure these devices built on a data modeling language called Yang. These Yang models allow us to easily create and configure software-defined services. We see so much promise in this area that I'm announcing today that we're releasing our customized Yang design tool into the open source through the open daylight community. This will make it easier for outside developers and collaborators to create services that plug into our SDN framework. The Open Daylight community selected Yang as a foundational component for the Open Daylight controller, which is a key component of our SDN strategy. This comes on the heel of a, heels of another open source announcement in which we were involved a couple of weeks ago. We're active contributors to the OpenNFV, OPNFV, which just recently released an initial build of Arno. Arno is an important tool. It shows a lot of promise to that goal of allowing users to customize their platform to test different virtualized functions. You can only imagine how quickly the industry will move if we accomplish this. This move to open source isn't new, in fact, AT&T has a long history of leading in this area. You may not remember, but we were at the heart of Unix and C programming languages, both of which spawned generations of programmers. In the last few years, we've made several contributions to open source projects in cloud, in SDN, and in analytics that are at the core of our network transformation. And there will no doubt be many, many more. I hope you sense the themes here, both from what I've laid out today and previous announcements. Faster, more agile, scalable, open, cheaper. We have a saying at AT&T that you've likely heard. The network is on demand, the office is mobile, and the cloud is secure. We like where we are and know there's a lot of work to be done. We've made it clear that the future of our network, frankly, the future of our company, is in software. 75% by 2020, 5% this year. We're well on the way to meeting those goals. Thanks for your time today. I appreciate the feedback that I get both within the room and outside. We've received a lot of feedback from you, and we continue to get it, and we appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to open it up to question and answer. There are microphones here in the front of the room.
So folks... Uh, Guru is going to come help with Q&A. Yes. So I'm in case I get hard questions. I mean, I, <laughs> first, I think, John, I want to congratulate you. I want to thank you for what you're doing for not only for AT&T, uh, but for the industry as well. And I also want to wish you all the best for what lies ahead. So uh, before other people um, show up and um, uh, ask questions, I want to ask you a couple of questions about how are you, I mean, I, I know you're contributing and participating a lot in open source. What do you see the implications of that on the business models of the whole value chain? Uh, how does that play out in your mind? Well, I think that when you look at the overall spectrum of things, um, you have to define what you're going to develop internally and what is going to become your secret sauce. As I always say, that, that sauce should be like Tabasco size, um, not in gallon jars. Uh, it really has to be very unique. And then you, you look at the process by which you co-create. There will be some things that you would co-create with companies in the ecosystem and then there are things that belong out in, and, and so the reason one would do that is there are a lot of complex interfaces into legacy systems and so on. And so there is some work that needs to be done in co-creation. And then the, the majority, I would say, can and does go into to open source. And so I think most of the, the ecosystem that supplies us historically is in the process of transitioning their business model to one that works for them so they can get reasonable returns on their research and development and works for us. And so it's an evolution, not a revolution. The world doesn't end tomorrow, it changes tomorrow. And I think that what we'll see is that uh, we will gravitate towards a new business model that's different in how we pay for the work that we get done, different in how we operate the things that we get, and fundamentally changes the relationship we have with suppliers. Okay. Uh, I guess I, I can keep asking questions, but please go ahead. Good morning. Um, you mentioned uh, migration of uh, TDM circuits to Ethernet and the increase in you know port counts. Uh, yep. What's AT and T's strategy to prove to customers that Ethernet is as reliable um, a service as TDM, and that we can produce the same type of experience for customers with Ethernet that we can with TDM? It's, it's great because you don't have to actually make anything up. It's in the data. It, the, the reliability is, is very strong. I think that uh, this, the migration really started to stimulate around 2009 where the risk-reward trade-offs of moving to the new architecture changed for CIOs. The enterprise customers, the CIOs, had been up to that point, I think, risk-averse. And I don't think anything changes in the risk-reward ratio other than I think there was a propensity to take a little more of the risk um, and in fact, most of our customers tend to shift that risk to us and say, just make it work. And I think the reliability and, uh, and the performance has been there. And so it really has become an easier case. There's just, you know, uh, the migration costs have been an impediment, and I think those are starting to come down. So I think the investment case for CIOs has improved dramatically. Um, I don't think it's as hard to sell as... Um, it used to be because we've hit a critical mass. So that curve I showed you is accelerating, not decelerating. And so I think it's moving down market from large companies that have uh, a good, uh, large enough staffs to evaluate complexity and build complex rollout plans into things like local school districts and smaller businesses that want to see the benefit of higher bandwidth and a lot of this capability. Did you, did you uh, have to build any new tool sets or whatever um, to prove that to your customers? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. I mean, if you look at, um, I, I mentioned a little bit in my prepared remarks that, uh, that tooling is an important part of this. That it not only uh, tooling for an understanding of how to troubleshoot and keep reliability high, but all of the other elements of tooling like reporting and such things that allow people to get comfortable with adoption. And so that's an important part of what we do. Um, operations can't be an afterthought here. It has to be carefully baked in. And, you know, we, we're using a slingshot model where you pull the ops people up into the development cycle. They slingshot all the way through, inherit the platform, but they're familiar by the time the software hits the network. And so we're doing that in both directions. The developers kind of work their way to operations, come back home to development. And, uh, and so, so I think that's an important part of 
what anyone has to do in this design is to think about the operational implications. In fact, they may be more complex than the architectural stuff up front. Thank you very much. Hey, I think yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, Alberto Leon Garcia from the University of Toronto. I was wondering if you could comment on the impact of this remarkable transformation on the competitive and collaborative positioning of AT&T with regards to over-the-top players? Well, I think we've been embracing over-the-top players for quite some time. The interfaces that we've had have been sort of ports and pipes and addresses. And I think the, we're evolving now into a little more complexity. And so uh, what we've seen historically has been more network-centric. I think what we're now have our discussions are more um, application and event centric. So if, if, if there's a new Apple uh, update on its software going at the same time that there's live broadcasting of the masters at the same time they're releasing uh, Game of Thrones or House of Cards or Orange is the New Black, that now network operators have to figure out how to manage those demands. And so it becomes a lot more collaborative, if you will, within the ecosystem. But, but it's also very important that we remain fiercely competitive with our competitors. So we're not doing this altruistically. You know, there's economics in this. We believe they're there. We think there's benefits to being first. And so we, we really are trying to gain an advantage vis-a-vis -vis our competitors. But the OTT guys, is, you know, I, I think that we're moving to more software interfaces and connections. One of the things on Guru's roadmap is to look at just, you know, how was traditional peering, how can it evolve to more of a software-defined approach? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Back to the TDM uh, question, what, what bothers me is quality of service. If you're doing things like uh, 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 very real-time type things, uh, telemedicine, telesurgery, uh, TDM will give me the type of quality I need to perform those operations. In a loaded network, it's nice if the network's not loaded, but if you start getting a loaded network, how will you give those type of quality of service features to those high real-time systems that TDM did give you. Yeah, are you in the telecommunications industry? Well, I worked uh, with the DICOM communications and also telemedicine. Okay. So that's why I'm kind of interested, because like a, a glitch in, in an IP system sounds like a heart murmur, and you, when you're evaluating things, you could misdiagnose as someone yeah. with a, a mental, mental problem. Yeah, it's a thoughtful question. I'm going to start with giving you a little bit of a flippant answer in, in that if, if I go, if I deliver reliability through hardware and I have for a given service, uh, card level, shelf level, system level, and route level redundancy, and I've given you hardware reliability, and the maximum load I can put in that network is 40%, and someone offering a service over top can ride that network at 90% utilization through software reliability, who has lower cost? Mm -hmm. The person riding over the top. So therefore, it doesn't matter, because I won't be around to actually sell the service. And so you have to, play, you have to go to software-based reliability, because there's not the people who value the application and the TDM network won't pay for over time for that level of reliability. You have to solve the problem in software because it takes your utilization up. So um, it, it's not an either or, it's a both. You have to do it in software and it has to be reliable. So the way we think about it, and we, we care immensely about this, is we don't, wanna, we don't want five nines and nine fives to meet at the midpoint. Um, <laughs> what we want to do is we want to evolve the, uh, the software development to get better and better and more and more responsive, and then we want to match the application. And so when, when we get to 75%, you know, an astute question would be, why not 100? Because there are applications for which it won't be applicable. There's not only some performance ones that are, that are reasonably high, um, but there are also some that have such legacy processes embedded it would be irresponsible to walk away from your customers because so much of their operation is predicated on the physical dimensions of your network. And so in that 25% are contemplated several of those use cases. But over time, that hardware-based reliability will have to be priced according to, uh, a re on a relative basis according to its software reliability peers. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. Yes, sir. Uh, Mitch Oster with Sienna. A uh, question about your network on-demand service, in particular uh, the bandwidth on-demand. 
Um, we've got customers for our bandwidth on demand software, but some of them have concerns about um, are my customers going to give up their fixed you know, multi-year contracts for private lines or virtual private lines? And so a question, uh, have you experienced um, uh, accretion or cannibalism for your private line service with the bandwidth on demand? The, the, one would think that the average customer might buy less. I think they're buying at the same level and more of the burst is an increase than a decrease. And the burst increase is that bandwidth forgives a lot of other sins. So if you think about how you roll change in your network, how you manage things from, a, from the uh, customer, enterprise customer perspective, they like having the insurance policy of being able to dial up on a weekend if they're going to do something risky. And so up to this point, they sort of have baselined at historical levels and they've increased to throw uh, bandwidth at other potential challenges in their network. Thanks. Very good question. Yep. Thanks. Morning, John. Thanks. Um, both you and Andre alluded, or have have said it over the the course of the two days, and you alluded it to it in the previous gentleman's question. But I'm curious, what comprises the remaining 25 percent at the end of of um, 2020? Can you add any any color to what those applications might be, and do you have plans beyond 2020 to then uh, address what yes. remains? Yeah, so let me, the, the parallel for us is, it, you know, we as an organization, AT&T, are arguably one of the most aggressive IT shops in the world. And so if you think about it, last year we merged what was, what was IT and what was network, sort of inside the data center and inside the central office. We threw them together and we said we, sh we should treat them the same. Not the same literally, but how we manage the process. So in the IT environment, inside the data center, we have moved 60% of our apps to the cloud. And our target's 100%. And so what happened is when we set the target for 100%, everybody started and said, that's ridiculous. Why would you do it? It doesn't make sense. Well, if you take a 42-year-old mainframe app and you move it to a multi-tenant cloud environment, you gain a lot of valuable experience. Once the person does that, they can go take on an appliance in the wide area network. And so well, as we marched down that, we started with like goals at 50 and 60 percent. And now we're in the fourth year of that march. We're, this year, we're going to be almost two thirds of all of our enterprise apps in the data center are going to be multi-tenant cloud based. Our targets to get to 100. We won't get there. We'll come up in the mid 90s somewhere because there'll be some thorny app that doesn't make sense to do it. We're going to parallel that. We're going to parallel that. But the reason that we've declared the 75 percent you, you brought up the point, 2020 is important. We won't be able to retire everything by 2020. I wish we could. If, if we were allowed from a regulatory perspective to end of life all of our services that we don't like to provide because they're not architecturally elegant and they're costly to provide, then we probably would put a way more aggressive target out there. But the idea is that we're in an environment where we're going to have regulators, we're going to have big enterprise customers, and that's just those platforms that we think are going to extend beyond that. So if you were to give me another five years, I probably would give you a 95% target. Thanks. Yep. Yes, sir. Hi. Good morning. Uh, my question is a little preamble, so please bear with me. So last year you discussed uh, regarding operations and how do you retrain employees, and you said that uh, the uh, moral, the part of the business is to provide employees to transition to the new operations and the part of the employees to take the opportunity and go forward. You also worked on a program in some local university to provide that service. Yep. And now my question is, how are you on that road? What is the percentage of employees who have been transferring in this new way and what is the success rate? My question may be somewhat left-wing, but we are in a left coast. Yeah, well... Uh Great. Actually, uh, that's a great question. I, I, you know, the definition of a great question is one that I know the answer to, and I wanted to make that point anyhow. So <laughs> I, what I really should say is thanks for the question, not good question. Um, that we have 96,000 of our employees have registered for courses. We have 1.1 uh, million course registrations. We have 908,000 course completions. We have 56,000 people that have earned badges that stack on top of their degrees to make them eligible for the new environment. We're going to be adding additional university programs, and we have uh, broadened our courses to hit all of our areas. We've changed our IT systems, our compensation systems, how we rate people, how we manage people. And so that mass march of our folks is 
well underway as evidenced by those numbers. So we, we periodically keep those, those numbers um, updated, but I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to give those today. Yes, sir. Hey, so I'm not worried about TDM at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> What I am worried about. But you are about, worried about your laptop because you carried it up thinking it somebody might steal it. Actually, I was just. <laughs> I was actually. Because you might say something more interesting, so I wanted to make sure I could take notes. Um, what I am a little worried about is almost the other side of the equation, which is I hear the occasional echo in this conference of the good old days of intelligent networking, ATM, and, and this kind of very dense service rich network. And the problem, as we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years, is. When, an app, when you get, create a network and you say, oh, the application can have all these functions, the application turns out to not want very much from the network. And it's all getting handled somewhere at a higher layer, and the network keeps getting turned into something that's very transparent. What do you think you really can provide in the network that's tangible and real and, for lack of a better way to put it, not another dream? Yeah. Um I think that when you look at abstraction, the term I always use internally is it, it, you know, abstracting is like pixie dust. It lifts everything. You don't even know what you can do until you get it up. And then, so this disaggregation is about us doing abstraction and saying, oh my goodness, if we want to go do all these service rich activities, we need to disaggregate this and build it a little bit differently, componentize it. So we're actually doing that SOA architecture into functions that have been built into code that drive service-rich environments for 40 years. They've not been revisited. Um, and so we right now haven't seen a tremendous amount of limitation. The deeper we get, the more excited we get. So, you know, the only thing to fear is fear itself in this. Until you actually get into that with a commitment you're going to do it, you won't have the mindset that will, will get you to how do I do it. You get to how, what's, what's preventing me from getting there. So the only thing I'd say is, for us, it's such a big cultural and mind shift change that if you don't do that, these programs don't work because you'll stall early because you'll have too much experience. But I always, as I always tell my team, 25 years of experience can, some, can sneak up on you and be one year of experience 25 times if it's irrelevant, and the only thing you know is the vocabulary of the organization. So what we've, we, the goals that I speak here are an important part of what we do because those goals are commitments that the business makes, and then everybody sort of has to rally around it. And so I'm sure in this video, there's folks back at AT&T who are saying, please don't say that, don't say it, don't say it. Oh, darn it, he said it. Um, because those become the commitments of the business. Thanks. Hi, John, I wanted to ask about um, with uh, the bandwidth on demand service. Um, are, are there now or are there plans to provide API so that customers can uh, programmatically orchestrate increases in, in bandwidth, network services, et cetera, and then what's the granularity or the time frame that can be selected on demand? Um, the, everything we do is API. We're, as a company, everything we do is API. Anything that's needed is API. We're, we have, right now, at last count, we had about 4,600 APIs. A lot of those not for public consumption externally, but they are for partners, for customers, and sometimes we roll them into services as we saw with a product we call NetBond, which has taken our routing schema and APIing that to cloud providers so that a customer can buy a VPN and they can see uh, Azure or SoftLayer or uh, Salesforce.com. They can see that as if it's in their network, not on, hanging on the end of their network. And so th that, th that's how we intend to do it. So as you think about how we do this, We've taken policy and we've abstracted to the highest level so it's without limitation. It's just a question of what our marketing and product team think is reasonable. And so if they want to do it for a day, great. If they want to do it for an instant, great. We, we, it, it's not policy limited. And that was an important part of the structure here is how do you think about policy and therefore billing and such. Time for maybe, one more? Yeah, maybe one more. Last okay. one. Ooh, I got lucky today. <laughs> Hi, John. Dan Pitt from Open Networking Foundation. And thank uh, Mike Fratto for sort of setting up my question. It's about uh, programming interfaces. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in ONF, you know, we've been the champions of Open SDN from the forwarding plane with OpenFlow up to the definition of northbound interfaces. And we're working with the uh, major open source projects to define and code some of those in open source ways. Now, <clears throat> it's important that these be both open 
and functional for the operators. And I know operators like AT&T want to both program the network themselves, as you stated, and also allow their customers to access it through some other interfaces in your network on demand. The uh, trajectory of, of open source projects can go one of two ways. Either they produce sort of major artifacts that everybody uses, or they become embedded into proprietary products, which is an efficient development mechanism. So sort of two related questions. What is AT&T's sort of intention to contribute rather than just consume these open source project uh, outcomes? And the second, to what extent does AT&T actually intend to adopt these, build their own solutions around them, or look to certain vendors or a large, large number of vendors that have incorporated the open source projects and buy their products from them at the risk of their defining the northbound interfaces? Yeah, so in that I think there was part of credit to you guys for the work you did. That's, that's in, in the role that you have, so, so appreciate the work that you're doing. I don't want to repeat anything I've said earlier because that would be disrespectful of the audience, but um, we did talk about us putting those things out. So let's just talk about what matters. You have to look at the research intensity and the sustainability, and then you have to make some judgments about what belongs in open source and what doesn't. If it's heavily research intensive, multi-year in nature, doesn't produce a lot of code in the short run, then it's a candidate for a more proprietary solution that may take some time in a, a traditional standards-based process. Um, and, and other areas would lend themselves very well to open source. This is um, not science, it's art. Nobody has a great approach. Everybody keeps some secret sauce. There is nobody who operates entirely open source and keeps a franchise. Um, and so you have to balance that. So internally, just to so give you an idea, we've marched from uh, open source being you know, roughly 5% of our code to a target where it's going to be probably north of 50. That's a 10x increase, that's dramatic. But we don't have processes in place that say very clearly because everybody has an opinion. So in an organization at our side, it's highly distributed, we're not going to please you all the time. That's frankly not our objective in life. But there are other times where we're going to surprise you by putting something out. It will be an internal decision process of where, where does it best belong. And the only thing I can tell you is that we are open-minded and we are deliberate. So we're not, the accidents might be things going out. The accidents might be things staying in. I'm trying to avoid accidents as a leader of the business and make sure that everything is deliberate and thoughtful. So I think you're going to see more from us. You have seen a lot from us. We have a long legacy of putting stuff out in open source. I mentioned earlier programming languages. I mean, we've been all over this stuff. And so I think you're going to, people will be surprised by how far we're willing to go. But we are going to be thoughtful, and it won't be all the way. Thank you. We're really valuable when you give input to these projects. So thanks again. Thank you. So John, thank thanks you. so much. We can keep you longer, but unfortunately yeah. that can't be the case. <laughs>